Hello, it's Scott Manley here with Asteroid Update for September 2016 and we have had a very, very busy month. Not least because in the last few days we have just seen the launch of a Cyrus-Rex on its way to the asteroid Bennu and we will have more details on that later. But let's first step to another little news item for Asteroid fans out there. Now you might know that Brian May is one of the founders of Asteroid Day and uh, on the 5th of September, which would have been Freddie Mercury's 70th birthday, he announced that Asteroid 1991 FM3 was being renamed to... It will be called Asteroid Freddie Mercury, all one word, 17473, and it was discovered in 1991. And this is to honour Freddie's 70th birthday. Freddie Mercury was one of the greatest frontmen in rock history, if you ask me, and he died back in 1991, the same year that this asteroid was discovered. Asteroid Freddie Mercury spends most of its time in the inner asteroid belt, uh, moving between 2 and 2.8 AU from the Sun. Information from the NEOWISE mission uh, gives us a radius of approximately 3.4 kilometers, and yes, it's another uh, great tribute to a great individual. Since we're on the subject of Brian May, it would seem to be an appropriate moment for us to uh, follow up with last month's competition. If you remember, the prize was a t-shirt from the Asteroid Impact Mission, as signed by Brian May. Uh, we asked you to ask us your asteroid questions, and the best one would get answered. So uh, the best one that was selected was by Music Lane, and uh, the question was, how are asteroids and their observations useful in science? What can we learn? So, of course, we pass this on to uh, the experts at ESA, and here's a little video by Patrick Michel. Understanding asteroids allows us to understand planetary formation, to study the origin of Earth, to study how to protect us from the impact of a dangerous one, and to understand how we can use them as resources. So, there you have it. Thank you, Patrick. Now we are going to continue the competition again, another chance to win a signed t-shirt from ESA and this month uh, we're going to ask you to tweet at us uh, what inspires you about asteroids, right? So uh, basically send us your tweets with the hashtag aim mission hashtag and uh, yeah we will, uh, we will follow up with your answers and the best one we'll get will be in the running to win a t-shirt signed by Brian May. Okay, so now back to the main event of the month. OSIRIS-REx has launched, and while I could talk for hours about this mission and its various uh, plans and capabilities, we decided it would be much more interesting to go straight to the source. Here we have, via the magic of internet video conferencing, Dante Loretta. Hello. How are you doing, then? I am doing really well, my friend. And how is the Cyrus Rex doing? Cyrus Rex is healthy and happy, uh, operating nominally, and uh, on its way to Bennu. And how was the launch for you? The launch experience was really transcendental. I mean, it was unbelievable. Emotionally, just the adrenaline, the excitement, the anxiety, all of it culminating in uh, a absolutely perfect, flawless performance from the Atlas V and the spacecraft on that day. A lot of people were actually really interested when they pointed out this was going to be launching with a single solid rocket booster. Did you feel any like pangs of concern given your, say, background in science? <laughs> well, I actually uh, spent a lot of time looking at rocket design and really is one of my hobbies is understanding how the rockets work. And I knew all about the 411 configuration and I got to go underneath the rocket and see it kind of look right up the main engines, crawl around in the vertical integration facility where we were putting it together. And they, they line that solid rocket booster right up with the two nozzles of the RD-180. So it kind of makes a triangle. So it looks pretty good from that perspective. And they just have to cant the RD-180s in about 8 degrees to make sure the center of thrust goes right up the middle of the vehicle. So it's a pretty straightforward design when you look at it from that perspective. Absolutely. A lot of people were definitely interested. And I'm now very jealous of you for getting to go there. <laughs> so yeah, OSIRIS-REx. Who came up with that acronym? Because that must have taken forever. <laughs> Uh, I'm totally responsible for that. You can blame me for Osiris. How long did you spend on it? Uh, well, it started out when I first came on board on the program. It was 2004, and I was the deputy principal investigator under Dr. Michael Drake, who the mission was dedicated to, uh, by the way. 
And his job to, for me was to go and come up with the science plan and write the part of the proposal about why do we want an asteroid sample, what are we going to do scientifically, and what are the big questions that we're asking. And I really right away wrote down four words. I wrote down origin, spectroscopy, resources, and security. Because those capture really the four areas where we look to asteroids for major scientific um, information. And I saw that I had OSIRIS pretty close, and so I just bought a couple vowels, kind of crammed <laughs> spectral interpretation and resource identification into the acronym to make it to flesh it out. And we bid the program as OSIRIS for actually two different discovery proposal rounds to NASA. And we did well, but not well enough to win. And then when we came out as a New Frontiers program, we decided we wanted to still keep OSIRIS, but we wanted to be bigger and stronger and better than just an OSIRIS mission. So we uh, jokingly threw out OSIRIS-REx and then uh, kind of laughed about it for a while. And then we went, man, man that's actually pretty cool and uh, really sounds like a dinosaur. And we all know how the dinosaurs <laughs> ended. So uh, we thought that connection was worth pursuing. And I call it my backronym. I made it the Regolith Explorer so that we could really be Osiris Rex. Because it was a Regolith Explorer before you added the Rex, let's be clear. That's right. It, it was a great way to describe the mission because the other terms in the acronym don't end on a noun. And Regolith Explorer makes us a noun. So I was glad to have that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and nobody had any problems mixing up the ancient Egyptian god and uh, Latin. Uh, well, maybe some people <laughs> did, but not me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the, the launch happened. You, the mission now is going to go out for on a one-year orbit, and then it's going to perform... Well, it'll perform a, a maneuver in deep space, and then it'll come back and uh, get a gravity assist from the Earth. Correct. And then we'll have one more deep space maneuver after that, and that sets some on the rendezvous trajectory with Bennu. Okay, and so the rendezvous will happen in what year? We're looking at the uh, beginning of our approach phase in August of 2018, and that's when we just start detecting Bennu with the cameras. We'll still be half a million kilometers out, and we'll spend that whole approach trajectory characterizing the asteroid, looking for any natural satellites, comet activity, dust, anything like that that we have to worry about in operations. And so from even then, it'll be like another uh, several months, almost a year before you're really in orbit and investigating. It'll go right? faster than that. So uh, within a couple of months, we'll enter in the preliminary survey phase. That's hyperbolic flybys of the asteroid. And then by the end of 2018, we should be uh, just about ready to go into orbit around the asteroid. And OK, and so you spend then a year or so? characterizing everything? That's right. We're, you know, one of the things that we're really fortunate about when you're studying a small asteroid is it's real easy to change your position, your orbit. You can leave orbit. You can re-enter orbit. Uh, you're kind of like a hummingbird buzzing around this thing and getting all the different angles. And we'll spend over a year doing full global maps of the asteroid and identifying some regions of interest that we want to characterize at a more detailed level as potential sample sites. And finally, you will Ma very carefully, very gingerly go in close and try to pluck, up a, pluck off a piece, right? Yeah, the nominal plan for the OSIRIS-REx mission is to get that sample in July of 2020. So that gives us about two years to map it, pick the site, and then rehearse all of the steps that it takes to get the spacecraft down to the surface. Very slow and methodical is, is how we're going to approach this problem. And then by the time we get around to July of 2020, exactly right, we'll have all of the maneuvers planned, we'll have rehearsed them, and we'll go ahead and commit the spacecraft to that five-second touch-and-go contact sampling maneuver. Now, uh, you've just, I've heard this described as a space vacuum, and space is already a vacuum. Could you explain, perhaps, how a vacuum can <laughs> work in a vacuum? Yeah, we're more like a space <laughs> vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner, uh, yes. So, uh, and w the reason that works is because we bring our own atmosphere with us. So we already have the vacuum of space in order for a vacuum to work, you need that pressure differential. And we create that by injecting gas into the uh, regolith at the surface of the asteroid. And then that vortex kind of sucking action pulls it all up through our filter, and then some of the gas escapes back out into space. So we're like a vacuum cleaner in reverse. So it's more it's like a donut-shaped blast of air that blows some of the stuff inwards. Exactly. So the high pressure is outside, is you know, just underneath the filter head, and the vacuum is on the outside of it. So the air follows that path. And you're expecting anything from about what 50 grams to two kilograms of material? The baseline science requirement is 60 grams. 
And uh, the tag SAM sampling mechanism is designed to a minimum of 150 grams. Uh, and that's just margin on the science requirement. But when it fully fills the sampling filter, it's over two kilograms of material. And I hear that as you pull away, you'll characterize the sample you have. You'll point a camera at it, and then you'll rotate the spacecraft to get an idea of the moment of inertia. Absolutely. The OSIRIS-REx team has come up with a really thorough plan for evaluating sampling success. We'll analyze all of the imagery and other data that we collected when we made contact with the asteroid. Not only our cameras, but our inertial measurement units. There's a spring in the TAGSAM forearm, and we'll measure its compression, telling us everything about how we interacted, what was the blowdown profile of the TAGSAM gas. Then we'll get the, the uh, sample head into the field of view, and we'll be able to look at the bottom of it. We'll look at it edge on, see if we have any physical you know, photo documentation of sample in the collector. And then you're exactly right. We'll spin the spacecraft around, sticking the arm out 90 degrees from the sampling configuration. We'll do that before we get the sample. We'll repeat it after we got the sample. And we'll have a, an accuracy of about 20 grams change in mass in that, in that sample head, which is a sufficient precision for us to determine if we have had success. Okay, and so then after that, the next step is to return the canister home? Yeah, we can't leave Bennu until March of 2021. That's when our departure window opens. Just like we ha uh, had our launch window, which opened up on September 8th last week, uh, March of 2021 is when the departure window opens up. We'll fire our main engines one final time, and that single burn gets us on a ballistic trajectory to intersect the Earth in September of 2023. So Bennu is actually interesting for, well, it's interesting especially for our asteroid day because uh, it passes very close to the Earth regularly, every six years? Yeah, so Bennu and the Earth have a relative uh, orbit period of about six years. So every six years, they're in close proximity to each other. And you can see that kind of discovered in 1999, uh, great observing opportunity in 2005, again in 2011. We're launching here in 2016, setting us up for that gravity assist in 2017, when Bennu was close to us again, and then finally samples come home in 2023. So that September every six years kind of sets the whole mission profile. And based on the observations we have right now, we think there is, uh, we can't rule out a future impact by this asteroid. Bennu is classified as a potentially hazardous asteroid. We've done a lot of work on the OSIRIS-REx science team to evaluate its future trajectory. Uh, we know it comes very close to the Earth in 2135, so a little less than 120 years from now. Uh, and it's going it to be in between the Earth and the Moon during that event. And the solution after that kind of scatters. We see one out of every 2,700 or so trajectories ends up on a return and an Earth impact. One of the things about Bennu, I think, is because it's small, dark, and fast spinning, it is especially influenced by the Arkovsky effect. Absolutely. Uh, understanding the Arkhamsky effect is one of the key science objectives of the OSIRIS-REx mission. This is a phenomenal you know, a force that is different than gravity. So gravity and Kepler's laws allow you to predict where planetary objects are going to be in the future. But as they get small enough, say less than a kilometer in diameter or so, the absorption of energy from the sun as sunlight and the re-emission of that same energy as heat back out into space acts like a thruster changing the trajectory of the asteroid. And we're going to understand that in, in great detail for Bennu, but also overall so we can apply it to asteroids across the solar system. So I, I play games, and I hear that you guys have been uh, working on a game for uh, this mission. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of board games, strategy games. Uh, we have regular game nights with the team members here on OSIRIS-REx. And one of the things I did with my family, I have two young boys who are now seven and nine, to get them involved in the mission is we work together to create uh, Extronaut, the game of solar system exploration. This is a, a card game, board game, where you're competing with the other players to build rockets, to go to destinations across the solar system and score your science points. It's really get aimed towards kids seven and up. Uh, there's some great educational information about OSIRIS-REx and Bennu in here. So it's been used by educators and families and just for adults who want to have a good time. That sounds great. Big fan of games. I'm probably going to have to get it and try to make the kids play it. <laughs> Thank you. Available on Amazon.com. There we go. I'll put a link in the uh, put a link at the bottom of the video. Awesome. So yeah, Dante, thanks very much for coming in. Wish you the best of luck with this mission. We'll be keeping an eye out for everything. And uh, 
of course, we'll probably have a, an update around uh, next year during Asteroid Day. So thanks. My pleasure. Check in whenever you want. See ya. Take care. So there you have it. Thanks to Dante for his time. We will obviously be following this mission over the next seven years or so. And uh, we wish it a great deal of luck. Obviously fascinated to see what happens. But uh, that is enough for us this month. We'll be back in future months with more asteroid updates, more special guests. And just remember, get your uh, answers or get your competition entries out on Twitter. The hashtag is hashtag aim mission. And we'll see you in future episodes of Asteroid Update. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.